do we Julia uh, uh, Logan, and she's going to moderate this session, and I think that's what I have is correct. Is that right, Miss uh, Mr. Miles? <laughs> That is correct, Mr. Jones. Okay, uh, thank you, Ms. Frost. <laughs> so, so uh, I'm very sorry, and it's not my place to do this, but there's actually one more part to my extremely lengthy presentation. <laughs> oh, it is? Oh, okay. Um, all right, I, I got my agenda got here mixed up. Okay, well, please proceed. <laughs> Mar Marta, do you give give me free reign or shall yes. I? Yes, I give you free reign. Thank you, Mary. And I was about to jump in uh, as well. So yes, well, we have uh, the last section, which is the most actionable section for us. And that's the, now that we've learned all about the basics, it's uh, the areas for our focus moving forward. Okay, all right. So, so thank you again. And I do know it's been a lot of me. So I hope this will be a uh, constructive and helpful conclusion to the conversation. Um, so we've now, as Marta said, traveled through this basic overview of healthcare financing and delivery, talked about system shortcomings, inventory, different organizations and actors. And now I'd like to offer uh, a few thoughts about areas of focus where CalPERS has particular leverage and, contribute, and can contribute to continued excellent outcomes for its members, and at the same time contribute to system-wide improvements. The caveat here is that I offer these ideas knowing very well that I don't know as much about uh, as all of you on the board and as staff members do about the realities you all face and the priorities you've set and the values you hold. But I am hoping that I can offer some food for thought for your ongoing work. Next slide, please. So starting um, with data reporting, and we touched on this in the conversation about transparency earlier. CalPERS, by virtue of its size, its internal resources in the form of a data warehouse and analytics staff, and its external partners, has substantial continuing opportunity to collect, analyze, and report data. The purpose of such data, of course, would be to better understand outcomes around quality, cost, racial disparities, access. Some of the important areas for analysis might include many of the topics we've already touched on, how well health plan networks are performing, the influence of particular hospitals or provider groups within network on cost by itself or cost together with important outcomes like quality. Regional variation in cost, including how those correlate with plan differences where poor outcomes are emerging and how to influence plans or providers to address them. Data can also be used to understand these racial disparities that we've been talking about, although uh, there may be some limitations on how definitively you can speak to um, very small populations or very rare um, conditions or outcomes. And data can be used to assess out access issues. So for example, through surveys of CalPERS members. Taking advantage of the wealth of data and the breadth of the CalPERS membership Thoughtful data collection and well-resourced analysis has the potential to pay dividends in terms of better member outcomes and perhaps wiser use of resources. An added bonus, at least from somebody like me who thinks about the healthcare system, is that what CalPERS learns about the system overall, as opposed to its unique membership, can be instructive and helpful for many other purchasers um, within that and within that broader policy context. Turning to the right side of this chart, um, analytic work in turn, going through that data, identifying some of the issues and sources of, of difficulty. Analytic work helps CalPERS identify particular interventions that can improve outcomes for its members and for its program performance. So for example, uh, tracking pharmacy spending and scrutinizing areas of potentially excess spending has led CalPERS to develop an acquisition-based uh, acquisition-based contract with PBMs and consider other ways um, to structure payment to uh, provide incentives for less costly care rather than to allow more costly care. The previously mentioned biosimilars initiative, another way uh, to address high prices for specialty drugs. 
I understand that um, because imaging diagnostics can be such high priced areas, um, CalPERS has explored ways to create competition via alternative networks or, uh, or different imaging sites um, so that they are not packaged together um, to the extent that uh, they have been at some points. Um, centers of excellence or other low cost, higher quality arrangements for certain high cost procedures can be a strategy. So again, if the data leads you there, there are ways to intervene. And then targeting more appropriate access or different sorts of services to support behavioral health outcomes is another opportunity about which um, I believe the next set of speakers will um, talk. So the overarching point here is that, in, in my view anyway, CalPERS is in an enviable position in terms of having enough data to understand and unpack many of the factors that lead to subpar outcomes. And then to work either independently or with its health plan partners to intervene in these targeted ways. Next slide, please. Another set of actions that CalPERS is extremely well positioned to advance involves the imposition of plan contracting requirements that are tailored to advance population and member health outcomes. So these can cover a lot of ground and just to illustrate um, health plan reporting on consumer experience, quality, equity issues. Process indicators around um, network or around consumer experience or access. So uh, for example, indicators of racial ethnic language, language diversity within the network that the plan is contracting, and many, many others. Covered California um, has led the way in some ways in imposing many such uh, requirements through what it calls its contract attachment seven. Um, and uh, I understand that CalPERS is exploring now some ways that it might adapt or adopt some of those contracting requirements for its purposes. Importantly, um, imposing those contracting requirements, particularly if they're well aligned with other large purchasers in California, has benefits that go beyond the CalPERS membership. When signals are aligned across multiple purchasers, especially such large purchasers as CalPERS, Covered California, and Medi-Cal, say, plans receive one strong signal rather than multiple competing signals, and, and they can focus on the things that you all as purchasers have really prioritized. Um, and eventually, of course, other employer uh, plans may emulate CalPERS as well. As requirements trickle down to providers, too, those clear and unified messages are much more likely to influence system change than our efforts pursued by CalPERS alone or by any other one single uh, purchaser. So, you know, there are, I think, many opportunities. And again, I, I imagine that you all will have ideas that far exceed any that I could dream up. But the notion is that CalPERS has the opportunity to amplify its priorities by aligning with other purchasers and coordinating with them to advance those outcomes. Um, this not only um, affects the possibility of system-wide change, it reduces some of the burden, the administrative burden on the plans and especially the healthcare providers so that hopefully there will be some uh, easing in costs as well. So um, to conclude, next slide, um, to summarize this short section, which was really intended more to spark further conversation uh, than to further inform, um, we've, I hope, um, communicated it perhaps too many times that CalPERS exists in a complex healthcare ecosystem, that there are many, many other players and many competing forces. Um, but I think that you have these particular assets around data, focus and ability to attend to the access quality uh, service outcomes that you care most about that will allow you to continue to leverage your particular areas of strength um, to advance those outcomes and exert those system impacts that you're hoping to achieve. So thank you for the extra uh, little bit of time. And um, again, I think the notion here is now for any further comments or discussion. Mr. President, you're muted. Thank you. 
Okay, I was just saying, I think that uh, this completes this uh, presentation for real this time. <laughs> and so we, uh, we'll see if we have any um, questions from uh, board members. And if not, we'll check to see if we have any people from the public who wish to speak. I don't see any board members request. Uh, so Mr. Fox, are there any uh, members of the public who wish to make comments? Mr. President, no, there are no public comments at this time. Okay, well, thank you very much. And again, thank you for a wonderful presentation. And uh, I'm sorry about that. I I can't cut that off behind me. Uh, it'll go off in a minute. Uh, <laughs> okay, it went off. Uh, anyway, so we want to thank you for an excellent presentation, and I think the dialogue was very helpful and fruitful, and we look forward to our continuing discussion uh, along these paths to see how we could uh, always improve our health services to our members, and also to see if we could sharpen the curve on the cost element. So. Thank you again for your presentation and uh, support. So now we will move on to, wait a minute, I got a comment, Mr. Mr. Fechner. Thank you, Mr. President. I just wanted to <clears throat> join with you in your comments and thank Ms. Multi for a very enlightening and, and very nice presentation. So thank you very much for being with us today. Thank you. Thank you, it was, it was my pleasure to be here and I really appreciate the opportunity. Okay, thank you. Okay, so now we will move on to the next item on the agenda. Dr. Julia Hogan, are you on as the moderator? I am, can you hear me? Okay, now we can hear yes. Oh, good, okay. So I will go ahead and get started. Good afternoon and welcome. And um, my name is Julia Logan, CalPERS Chief Medical Officer. As Marcy, Marcy mentioned this morning, we presented about a year ago on our mental health challenges and opportunities. And at that time, several of the larger health plans also presented to you about their behavioral health landscape. Today, we'll provide an update on behavioral health, which will encompass both traditional mental health issues like depression and anxiety, as well as substance use. I'd also like to take this opportunity to introduce a new CalPER staff member, Dr. Heather Reedhead. Dr. Reedhead is a family physician and preventive medicine public health physician. And she comes to us with a wealth of experience in clinical quality improvement and behavioral health. She'll be taking the lead on the clinical behavioral health work with our health plans, and I'm really glad to have her on the team. She'll be discussing some of the actions we've taken over the past year later in the presentation. So next slide, please. Oh, I think, oh, okay. So next slide after that one, thank you. I wanted to briefly walk you through our time together today. We will first talk about our statewide behavioral health challenges and then discuss behavioral health as a strategic priority will highlight the profound impact of the pandemic on the need for behavioral health services and access to this care. Then we will move on to, then we'll move on to the work we've done to address both quality of care and access to care. The work our health plans and pharmacy benefit manager have done in partnership with, over, with us over the past year and the advantages of cooperation and alignment that Marion just talked about with other large partners in our state to make positive change in the healthcare system on behalf of our members. There will be time for questions and discussion at the end. Some of this information overlaps with prior presentations from last year as we wanted to bring up to speed the new board members and board members who are not on PHBC about our challenges and the importance of behavioral health while also updating you all on our work and actions over the past year. Next slide, please. So why do we need to focus on behavioral health and what are the challenges? Uh, historically, our society has had a hard time talking about mental health and an even harder time talking about substance use. There's a lot of guilt and shame and blame that discourages people from engaging with care and this inhibits effective care delivery. 
There's also been great improvement in clinical care over the past 10 to 20 years, both with screening and treatment. We now understand the prevalence much better and the important impact of both mental health and substance use conditions on quality of life, disease prevention, and on the outcomes of almost every type of other illness and chronic disease, leading, of course, to important impacts on healthcare expenditures. Depression is the leading cause of disability, according to the World Health Organization, not just in the US, but worldwide. Obviously, disability can have large financial impacts for families and households and for employers. We know that to prevent disease and to improve both health and economic outcomes, we must also address behavioral health. Next slide, please. Last year, when we presented to you, we discussed many of the challenges that lay ahead of us in behavioral health prevention and treatment. Just a moment ago, I referenced the stigma and embarrassment that individuals may have in accessing services. But there's also a challenge of limited access to care, given our workforce shortages and less lim thus limited access to behavioral health providers. This is one of the main issues that all of our health plans focus on and try to address via recruitment, engagement with providers, provider groups and members, use of telehealth uh, that we'll talk a lot about, group sessions and emerging innovative technologies that we'll also discuss later. Over the course of this presentation, we will describe the progress that we've made, some of the ongoing and innovative work the plans have done to address these continued challenges how the pandemic has impacted our progress and really altered the behavioral health landscape possibly for many years to come, and how our collaboration with other state partners is helping us make a collective impact on behalf of our members and really all Californians. Next slide, please. The overarching goal of our strategic plan for health is to ensure that our members have access to high quality and affordable health care. We believe that our members should have access to the right kind of clinical care at the right time. There must always be an emphasis on improving preventive care and providing early and effective interventions that prevent hospitalizations and other intensive treatment. And behavioral health is key to both this prevention and intervention. For these reasons, we've included behavioral health as a clinical focus for our strategic plan. It's a risk factor, as we've mentioned, for severe illness and poor outcomes for all the major health conditions that we commonly think about. Diabetes, high blood pressure, heart disease, cancer. Last week in clinic, um, I saw a woman with diabetes and previously she, had, she always had good control over her illness and her numbers were really good. But recently her sugars were extremely high and worrisome. And I, as I spoke with her, I learned that she had been caring for two family members who were hospitalized for COVID-19. She was under an extreme amount of stress and anxiety, which undoubtedly had caused her blood sugars to spike. Our strategic plan initiatives keep us focused on behavioral health issues and also support the processes that improve behavioral health and other conditions. These initiatives include quality improvement programs, ensuring that health plans and clinical systems are continuously working to improve health outcomes. We also have a new growing and dedicated clin clinical team to engage with the health plans and our pharmacy benefit manager via collaboration, education, and contract requirements to encourage new innovative programs that are evidence-based, which means proven to improve access and health outcomes and a partnership with UC Davis Health researchers to help us conduct focus groups of our members to better understand their access challenges. We're also engaging with key system change partners, particularly other large purchasers of healthcare to help increase our leverage for change. Next slide, please. While we will delve deeper into our progress, I wanted to take a little bit of a step back and provide an update on a slide I presented last year on the prevalence of common behavioral health conditions among our members. The data, which comes from our data warehouse, indicates that the prevalence from 2018 to 2019 has stayed relatively stable among our members. 
with about a 5% prevalence for depression and 2 to 4% prevalence for anxiety, and then a 1% for substance use disorders. And just a caveat that this doesn't necessarily reflect the true prevalence of behavioral health disorders among our membership. Because it does come from claims data, these data only reflect those that had an encounter with the medical system. And our data um, from our warehouse is pretty consistent with national data on the prevalence of anxiety and depression. A national survey in 2018 showed that about 8% of American adults had depression in a given two-week period. Next slide, please. When we talk about mental illness, the most prevalent being depression and anxiety disorders, we really can't underestimate the need to address substance use. In this slide, you can see the overlap between substance use and mental health disorders. Almost 40% of people with substance use disorders have had mental illness, and almost 20% of those with mental illness have had substance use disorders. And often when depression and anxiety are highest is when people reach even more for alcohol and other substances. So we must be looking for both through screening and treating both in order to successfully improve healthcare quality and health outcomes. Next slide, please. So COVID-19, um, it's had a profound and lasting impact on each and every one of our lives. It's had an especially large impact on our emotions, uncertainty, the loss of sickness or loved ones, isolation from coworkers, friends and family members, and fear of contracting the virus at work if you're an essential worker. So it's certainly impacted us as individuals and as a society. And interestingly, the pandemic has helped us talk more openly about our struggles. To some degree, everyone is experiencing what life is like with anxiety. Though depression is the number one cause of disability worldwide, this is the first time that many employers and managers are thinking and openly talking about mental health in the workplace. And the crisis has made clear just how inextricable mental health is from physical health. You can't talk about the numbers of people who are sick or dying from COVID without talking about grief. And you can't talk about social isolation without talking about anxiety and depression. It's also disrupted the status quo of the healthcare system. One major and enduring way is the unprecedented uptake of telehealth. Prior to the pandemic, telehealth was an evidence-based and underused modality that just really didn't have any traction, in part because of technology challenges, but also because of payment barriers. In the span of about a week in our state, providers and patients alike had adopted telehealth almost universally. It was really quite amazing to witness and be a part of. And in my career, I've never seen such a dramatic change in clinical practice as the adoption of telehealth, and I, I may never again. And as Marion discussed earlier, the pandemic has had disparate impacts by race and ethnicity. And this has most certainly impacted people's behavioral health by race and ethnicity. For example, a recent report indicates that Hispanics were significantly more likely than the general U.S. population to see COVID-19 as a major threat to their health and to their finances. This chronic stress can impact long-term health outcomes as well. Next slide, please. I don't think any of you will be surprised by this slide showing the impact of the pandemic on mental health. Here you see that last March, about 30% of people reported that the pandemic was negatively impacting their mental health. And by July, it was up to 50%. And we found that our members have demonstrated an increased need for behavioral health services, which I'll be showing you shortly. And our health plans have been working to meet that need and have all been working on increasing recruitment efforts to address this ongoing issue. We believe that the increase in telehealth has also helped to meet this need in behavioral health services, as members have also really embraced the modality. So are we seeing limited access and longer wait times? Thankfully, so far, we haven't. We don't see evidence of delays or impaired access in our grievance and appeals data. On the contrary, despite the increase in demand, many health systems and plans 
are reporting that access is actually improved with the sudden widespread deployment of virtual services. You can imagine how much easier it is for a member who needs care in a rural area or even a small city to get an appointment with a therapist or psychiatrist who's actually in San Francisco or Los Angeles, and they never have to leave their house. For those that are also perhaps shy to go to a psychologist or psychiatrist's office, um, it, it may a video chat or a phone call much may, much, would be a much less difficult first step. And in my own experience, I found that in general, patients open up much more easily in their own environment about their mental health and substance use struggles than they would face to face in an exam room. Next slide, please. In the next four slides, we'll be showing our behavioral health data over one year from quarter three of 2019 through quarter three of 2020, so through August of 2020. And we're sharing these with you so you can understand the impact the pandemic has had on behavioral health utilization, and also to show you how we're using our data to inform our decisions and efforts. One caveat I do need to mention is that there is a lag in our data, as we've talked about earlier. Um, so the third quarter data may not be 100% complete. But in the interest of showing you our latest data and the impact of COVID, we chose to include our third quarter data of 2020. This graph shows our substance use treatment utilization per 1,000 members. And it shows a marked drop in utilization, as you will see from the next few slides. It's, it's slightly different than the overall utilization in behavioral health over the past year. One hypothesis is that members are seeking less treatment right now while we're all staying home, and there may be a delayed effect because of COVID. We know from national data that people are increasing their use of alcohol and other substances during the pandemic. And because of this, we're communicating with our plans about the importance of screening and the possible delayed effect of substance use in our members. In addition to our successful opioid safety programs, we have put additional safeguards in place to ensure members get the substance use medication they need. Uh, I'm sorry, substance use treatment medication they need as part of a medication adherence program with our pharmacy benefit manager. Dr. Reedhead will go into more detail about this later in the presentation. The data is also a really good example of the dynamic and uncertain landscape of healthcare delivery during the pandemic. Next slide, please. This slide reflects what we expect to see, a rise in utilization of behavioral health services during the course of the pandemic. If we know from national data and surveys that the need has gone up, and access is already a concern, we want to see that utilization of provider visits in the ambulatory care setting have gone up. We want to see that our members are getting the care that they need. And this slide shows the expected rise in utilization of behavioral health provider visits. If as many as 40% of members are experiencing symptoms of depression with a much smaller percentage actually engaging with a behavioral health care provider, then we might expect at least 200 encounters for every 1,000 members. The fact that we are closer to 1,400 encounters by quarter three is a good sign. It represents multiple encounters for every member seeking care. On the pharmacy side, we're also tracking behavioral health prescriptions because this gives us an indication of member access and met need. OptumRx, our pharmacy benefit manager, also reports increased use of medications to treat anxiety and depression. For commercial plan members, there was a 5% increase in anxiety medications over the past year and an 11% increase in depression medications. These percentages are consistent with their other lines of business data as well, which reassures us that members' needs are being met, met during the pandemic. Next slide, please. This slide shows hospitalizations for behavioral health services from the end of 2019 until quarter three of 2020. What we would hope to see is that all of our outpatient access to services is preventing inpatient admissions. 
And while we see a small rise early in the pandemic, overall, we don't see an, a rise in inpatient admissions, which is good. However, we do not assume that because the outpatient treatment is easy to access and so effective that no one needs to be hospitalized. That would be nice, but we can't make that assumption, and we know that a certain percentage of our members are going to need to be hospitalized. We also know that other factors may be at play. Most notably, our healthcare systems were changing patterns of care to protect healthcare workers and patients and preserve capacity for COVID care. Also, non-COVID related admissions were down in general. And in fact, research looking at about a million US hospital admissions over the course of the pandemic showed that hospital admissions were down almost 20% overall across all patient demographic groups. We will be continuing to follow this hospitalization data and to work with our plans to ensure that patients with psychiatric illnesses can obtain hospital care when and where they need it. Next slide, please. As we've discussed in the pandemic, we know that most behavioral services have been offered virtually via telehealth. We would expect this graph to show, and it does, a dramatic rise in behavioral health via telehealth between February and September 2020. By September, we see this come down slightly as people become more comfortable going back into their provider's offices for care. Again, just a reminder that September's data may not be 100% complete, and we may be seeing data lag with this. We anticipate that some of these changes will be permanent. We really don't expect the utilization of telehealth to come down to pre-pandemic levels now that there's a level of comfort with and appreciation for the convenience of care uh, for telehealth, especially for behavioral health on the part of both patients and providers. We've also been ensuring that our health plans have been messaging the ability to use telehealth to access behavioral health services where appropriate to members and reassuring members that should they need to access care in person, they may do so safely. Next slide, please. And really, we've had good evidence for many years that telehealth improves behavioral health access. Numerous studies have demonstrated its effectiveness across a range of modalities like telephone and video conference and mental health concerns like depression and substance use disorders. The evidence really shows that virtual services for behavioral health are safe, effective, and comparable in outcomes to in-person services. Several months ago, the National Committee of Quality Assurance, the same organization that serves as the accreditation body for our health plans, convened an expert task force to look at telehealth policy and what the effects were on the adoption of virtual clinical care for behavioral health and other types of clinical care. The findings for behavioral health were remarkably positive. Provider sy systems reported that telehealth removed significant barriers to care like stigma. Patients don't have to feel embarrassed about going to a behavioral health provider's office. That fear that they will be spotted has gone away. Also, as I mentioned earlier, patients are reporting they feel more comfortable speaking about their mental health issues when they're not face-to-face. -face. The task force also found that no-show rates, so patients not showing up for their appointments, declined dramatically for psychiatry visits, and substance use treatment had improved participation rates. In some areas, no-show rates had dropped from about 20 to 40% of visits before uh, pre-pandemic, to less than 5% of behavioral health visits during the pandemic. I do wanna make it clear that telehealth for behavioral health and other types of care is certainly not the only options for care for our members. Telehealth is particularly suited to behavioral health because the evidence shows that it breaks down stigma and improves outcomes. However, telehealth is used to complement and not replace in-person care and makes sense for many, but certainly not all. And we expect that our plans work with providers to make those options available to our members. Next slide, please. At the beginning of our talk, we mentioned the challenges we've been facing. Next, we'll walk you through some of the actions we've taken over the past year to address these challenges in the areas of increased dedicated staffing, engagement with health plans, alignment with our healthcare purchaser partners, 
understanding and improving access for our members, supporting telehealth, and ensuring high quality care is being delivered to our members. In terms of staffing, in addition to Dr. Reedhead, we're actively working to expand our behavioral health team to further engage and align to meet our goals of access and quality. I'm going to pass it on to Dr. Reedhead now, and she's going to walk through some of the areas we've been working on in more detail. Dr. Reedhead. Okay, Dr. Logan, if you can, we have a question perhaps on your presentation, Ms. Taylor. Yes, uh, thank you, Dr. Logan. This was very informative. I wanted to uh, just, you talked about the providers trying to recruit more. And we had talked about this before in a, uh, another session about uh, behavioral health, uh, not having access because there's not enough doctors. Uh, do you know what strategies they're using? Yeah, um, and I think Dr. Yes, um, and a, a very good question and one that we've been delving into a lot. Um, and we've gotten a lot of information um, through their National Committee for Quality Assurance report um, that we've been um, looking into a lot more. Um, and so they do it, They there's different ways. There's obviously recruiting of different pro specific providers um, and they they have a really good understanding of um, where the deficits may be. Um, and for a lot of plans, that deficit seems to be um, in prescribing behavioral health specialists, so like psychiatrists. Okay. And so they will um, actively recruit um, in different medical groups, different um, providers who aren't in medical groups. Um, there are different contracting mechanisms um, things like that. They also um, make sure that they message to providers who are already in their group about access issues and if um, specific providers have, um, have uh, kind of been deemed in the past for not providing access, they, they make sure that those providers are aware of those dings and, and how patients have been impacted. Well, that's good. Thank you very much. So, I, so mm -hmm. it sounds like mostly it's psychiatrists, but I do remember. Oh, my nose is itchy. Um, I do remember. I think somebody at our last meeting that we talked about this talked about just people they knew waiting forever just to get to see a psychologist, um, and then when you call around, unless you're in Kaiser which Kaiser has its own issues, but it, unless you're in Kaiser, you're given a list of 20 names, you call around, you get nothing, you have to get another list of 20 names because nobody's taking patients. Now, I don't know if that's still occurring or if that's been mitigated in any way. I think with the, um, with telehealth, I think that's uh, been mitigated to some degree. And I know that the plans are also trying to expand their telehealth networks kind of outside of COVID, that um, if they can draw in behavioral health providers from many different areas, then they can increase that access as well. Julia, and if I could, um, Dr. Logan and I also have spent some time talking to um, at least one of our commercial carriers about increased rates that they're paying to their subdelegated mental health plan um, for the purposes of increasing reimbursement rates to their non-physician uh, uh, mental health providers to be able to expand access because they're seeing um, what what th this commercial carrier believes is with the reduction in stigma around accessing behavioral health services and increase across the board in utilization, especially in therapy appointments. And so they were having a hard time maintaining enough um, non-clinician, non-physician uh, behavioral health providers. And so they actually started increasing reimbursement rates, which then, of course, will increase um, the what the, the parent plan has to pay the, the uh, behavioral health plan. Um, so it, it's, it's happening across the board, um, and they are working to recruit. So I just wanted to add that. I'll just jump in into and say um, that 
Another very innovative thing that has been supported by telehealth is um, allowing for psychiatrists to precept primary care physicians um, and nurse practitioners to be better mental health prescribers. So trying to increase the, um, the pool of prescribers, if you will, that feel more comfortable with behavioral health medications because they actually have a psychiatrist that they can call and ask. And uh, we call it precepting, but you know, ask their questions of. And um, uh, at any rate, it's just something that I think maybe existed in small amounts pre-COVID and um, pre the expansion of telehealth, but has been greatly increased. Um, and again, that like Julia was saying, that primary care prescriber um, or the psychologist or any member of the team may actually be in a totally different county, right? And that psychiatrist can be in LA, but they're actually precepting this behavioral health team that perhaps lives all over the state. Thank you very much. Okay. So was that Dr. Rehat speaking? I guess you are next. <laughs> I am. Were there any other questions or comments that we wanted to go ahead and address now, or shall I go ahead uh, and be? Just go ahead and continue, no further questions from board members now. Okay, great. Um, so go ahead and uh, please, uh, the next slide, that would be great. Perfect. So um, I think we've spent a lot of time talking about engaging with the health plans and fundamentally engaging with the plans and the healthcare provider system at large and working with these other purchasers of healthcare to guide, monitor, ensure adoption of best practices um, and access to evidence-based care for our members. That is the core of the work of our team. Um, however, we would be remiss if we didn't also incorporate engaging directly with our own members and doing a deeper dive into several of um, the challenging topics um, engaging with our members really provides an invaluable window into the pain points in the system that continue to per persist. Um, over the past year, we've begun three efforts to engage with members, all focused on access um, and primarily around behavioral health. Again, because access has been of paramount concern given the increased need and the demand in the system. So we've launched new questions on the behavioral, the health plan member survey that specifically address mental health and access, new questions. Um, we are partnering with UC Davis health service researchers to conduct an in-depth discussions about the experiences of members in each of our health plans. And we are conducting a very specific survey for members that have already completed a telemedicine visit to better understand the quality and their experience of that care. Um, lastly, not reflected on this slide, but we also continue to track and monitor grievances and appeals, which thankfully have remained flat despite increased utilization and despite overwhelming demand. This means as a percentage of the people that have used services, we have seen a decrease in grievances and appeals related to behavioral health. Next slide, please. Our 2021 health plan member survey now asks about symptoms of depression, the effect on daily life, and the patient experience pertaining to access. Specifically, the survey asks if the member was able to get counseling and treatment right away if there was an urgent need, or as soon as they wanted if it was not an urgent need. And we found from our last survey that more than 85% of Medicare members reported that in the past year they did actually receive counseling and treatment right away if it was urgent, or as soon as desired if it wasn't urgent. However, only about two thirds of our non-Medicare basic members got the care that they needed right away. And of course, this is not as good as we would like it to be. And it's prompted us to do, again, a deeper dive to try to understand more of the details of why there were those barriers to care. And reflecting on the conversation we just had, um, some of our questions are, is this about the mechanics of the system? Do you have to call a lot of offices, leave a lot of messages, wait for someone to call you back? Are there multiple steps between first reaching out for an appointment and then finally getting one with an individual provider? Is there no availability in your city or your county? Do you not feel comfortable with telemedicine if perhaps that was all that was offered or available at the time? These are the issues um, that we would like to uh, explore um, or, and are already exploring deeper with our follow-up surveys and focus groups. So we can hold our health plans and our provider systems accountable for addressing these challenges in service delivery and access. Next slide, please. We've also focused on other ways to hold our health plans and provider systems accountable for their work. 
All of our health plans are required to hold the NCQA National Quality Certification. And this accreditation has high standards for access, quality, and quality improvement processes for behavioral health. We look to this accreditation process to help ensure that our plans are integrating best practices in terms of quality access and affordability. However, we are also now taking a closer look at these documents that they submit to inform a more detailed discussion with our plans about opportunities for improvement and where we should focus our quality improvement efforts. These are friendly, educational, collaborative discussions about quality improvement. However, we are also looking at other models, including the contracts of large purchasers of healthcare to develop perhaps stronger ways to hold the health plans accountable for specific quality improvement plans. In our current contracts, we do already have additional performance measures that are specific to behavioral health prevention, screening, treatment, and case management, which includes the follow-up of high-risk events, um, perhaps an ER or hospital ER visit or hospitalization um, for mental health or substance abuse, and, and making sure that that person actually gets back into care in an outpatient setting that can be longitudinal. We are um, discussing improvements and performance measures um, additionally going forward to include more meaningful clinical outcomes. For example, there's movement in health systems to use scoring tools for both depression screening and also assessing severity of depression and monitoring treatment response. These are referred to, as to, uh, referred to as patient reported outcome measures or PROMs, um, and they are a part of the movement that's called feedback informed care. Um, these are not easy metrics for us to get right now. These are not performance measures we would be able to introduce tomorrow, but, um, but these are really good, strong performance measures that we would like to move forward with and help the, plan, help the health plans be able to do this kind of work in the future. We are also working to align with other purchasers around which performance measures we choose, essentially how we're all measuring quality for behavioral health. Um, and I know you've heard this before in the talks today, but with alignment, our demands become louder. They are amplified with the collective voice, which helps plans and provider systems to really focus on this topic as a priority. Essentially, when we all choose the same quality metrics, we see health systems pivot to make changes to meet the demand in a way that they never would for a purchaser with a smaller patient population. Next slide, please. So well before COVID, we knew that less than half of individuals with a mental health condition in the United States actually received care for this condition, and even fewer received evidence-based care. No one is surprised that like sleep problems, low mood, stress, anxiety, all of these interfere with daily life and work, including making and following through with healthcare appointments, um, difficult. And then especially when those healthcare appointments might seem strange, scary, or intrusive into very personal matters. So we work with the health plans to make sure they are supporting and sped, spreading best practices in their own outreach and in the healthcare delivery systems that include things like proactive and universal screening, the use of predictive analytics to find those patients who are most at risk for mental health and substance abuse challenges, like patients with uncontrolled diabetes or patients after a stroke or a heart attack um, or patients that already have a history of substance abuse and then to intervene as early as, early as possible in the mental health illness process. But again, that proactive reaching out, that proactive screening and identifying patients, that population-based approach is what helps really move the needle in behavioral health when in fact, again, we knew that half of people that needed care would not come in to get it. So we do have to be a little bit more proactive with behavioral health and substance use. We also ask plans to expand access to evidence-based services like telehealth, group classes, and self-directed digital health apps. Digital health technologies do have a tremendous and largely untapped potential to augment and extend care. Again, to lower the threshold, make it easier for patients to come into care, um, to find them earlier and more frequently than we would if we had to rely on them calling to make an appointment. They may never replace an in-person visit when that's needed, but one of the silver linings of the pandemic is that our eyes have been opened 
widened to these other possibilities and other opportunities that technology does provide. We work hard to be an educated consumer and to ask very informed questions, to keep asking for the best. And sometimes that means that we're educating our plans um, and the healthcare delivery system. For example, the CDC Preventive Services Task Force evaluated an online screening and education tool related to alcohol use, and they found that participants significantly decreased alcohol use just by doing a very brief electronic intervention. Many of these online tools then connected back to the healthcare plan or the delivery system in which the, and if the participant was ready to engage with a professional about their alcohol use or their related mental health concern. And this is the kind of population-based approach that is effective, it's evidence-based, but it's also affordable. And it's a great example of the kind of discussion around best practices that we bring to the health plans. Next slide, please. Once patients are in care, once they've already been identified to have that behavioral health need, we advocate for evidence-based interventions like integrated primary care and behavioral health or case management of high-risk patients. Both of these interventions, and in fact, any kind of population health quality intervention, requires that there is a shared registry of patients or shared dashboard with expected care delivery and outcome metrics. Um, we have been talking about this in the healthcare system for many years, and there are some good examples, but this is really an area that our healthcare delivery system still has a lot of room for improvement. Kaiser and Sharp offer their providers population health dashboards that include both primary care and behavioral health data and outcomes, so that the, the primary care physician and the behavioral health provider are actually looking at the same dashboard and, and are following those same data and outcomes that are expected for the patient to improve the collaboration between um, those two teams of providers. Other examples um, include um, standalone depression medication adherence pro programs, which also might be shared across venues um, or uh, may live solely with a pharmacy um, program like, a, like our pharmaceutical benefit manager. Care navigation and case management programs um, help transition patients between inpatient and outpatient settings, and many of our plans have these in place. Western um, Health Advantage actually has a case management program for very complex patients that also tries to address some of the social determinants of health that are playing into their um, mental health, um, substance use, um, physical health challenges. Um, and it would be very difficult to address those health challenges if you didn't also deal with some of the social challenges that are going on in the um, patient's life. And then Blue Shield offers one that is very specific for substance use treatment. And it actually has a multidisciplinary uh, team that is available, all specialized in addiction treatment, again, to help transition this patient from a more intensive inpatient setting to a longitudinal outpatient setting. Next slide, please. So ultimately, our engagement with health plans comes down to the levers we can push and pull to encourage adoption of a shared vision for access quality and equity, and then the best practices for actually improving the healthcare delivery. And what does this look like throughout the year? We um, uh, have our quarterly business reviews, including traditional reports and tracking of grievances and appeals. But we also have more sort of one-on-one -on -one technical assistance, in-depth medical director meetings to share information, make sure they're getting them up to speed, identifying opportunities for change, addressing quality improvement opportunities, um, or really looking at existing efforts that they already have going, um, and then encouraging, supporting, and really pushing them into making these transitions that we need to see happen. And ultimately, the most powerful mechanisms for making our changes are our contracting and performance measures. And ultimately, our goal is to build into our contracts the change that we would like to see in our healthcare delivery system. And I know you've heard this echoed throughout the day as we've listened to the different presenters. Um, but um, again, all of this work and all of these ideas fundamentally they do have to come into um, some sort of contractual mechanism if uh, we ultimately want to be able to make sure that they're, that they're actually gonna happen. Uh, next slide, please. Okay. 
We realize that medication management of mental health and substance use disorder is a particular concern. Um, we um, alluded to this earlier when we talked about prescribers and the shortage of psychiatrists um, and even primary care providers that are willing to do um, both psychiatric medications and medications that are used for substance use disorder. Um, thus, we are working with our pharmacy benefit manager and other um, health plan, uh, uh, other plan pharmacy partners to ensure that our members who are taking medication are actively managed and receiving their medications in a timely way. We've had great success over the past several years with our medication adherence program with OptumRx, and because of this success, we've decided to expand the program, again in partnership with OptumRx, for opioid use disorder. Um, and also other behavioral health drugs that are used for bipolar disorder. And this will go live in March of this year, March of 2021. In general, we've had success in the management and prevention of opioid disorder, which has um, really been um, fantastic news. I think for many of us in the healthcare field, this seemed uh, fairly insurmountable when we started really trying to address this number of years ago. Um, but as an example, Kaiser, um, as a result of a really active and comprehensive strategy, has decreased opioid prescribing by 62% in three years, from 2016 to 2019. And so we continue this work ongoing with our pharmacy partners to promote effective pain management um, alternatives, ensuring that providers who are continuing to provide opioids are prescribing lower doses and shorter courses when those opioids, again, are medically necessary, um, that we help members on opioid medications to reduce and discontinue the use of those medications safely, and that we do treat opioid use disorder when necessary. And with that, I'll go ahead and um, hand it back to Julia, who will conclude our presentation today. Thank you, Heather. So we've discussed what we're doing and what we've done to address behavioral health for our members. And we wanted to briefly touch on how we're looking at things over the long haul, because we do know this is a long-term, long-horizon effort. Of course, we'll be continuing to address access, as that's an ongoing complex problem. We will also be working on some evidence-based clinical efforts that we've touched on, including an innovative approach to mental health treatment called feedback-informed care that Dr. Reed had just mentioned. Um, feedback-informed care enables patients and therapists to work together in a new way using patient-reported information to track progress. And it's been proven to significantly improve the outcomes of mental health care. And while the technique seems really simple, it's actually profound in its implications. The patient's voice is at the center of every decision about their care. And that's really important to us at CalPERS, having the members' voices guide their care in an evidence-based way. We're working with health plans to ensure that feedback-informed care becomes embedded in clinical practice. We're also focusing on using data to make informed decisions and on mechanisms that support paying for quality and improvement over quantity. And last, we've discussed our health equity initiative with you previously, and we'll be continuing towards that goal of achieving health equity for our members. As was discussed this morning, health inequities have been exposed during the pandemic, but they are really long-standing inequities that we have an obligation to address. And especially Can we move important to the next slide. They... I'm sorry, Julia. I'm reading the notes here. Oh, Thank I'm you. sorry. Oh no. Oh, good. Okay. Good. Okay. I'm sorry. Um, just to, to reiterate about inequities, um, they're really long-standing inequities that we have an obligation to address, um, and especially with behavioral health. And we know that COVID will have lasting effects on our world and our members. And COVID has shown us in a really dramatic way that the healthcare system can change quite rapidly when forced to do so. Of course, as several of you have astutely pointed out today, the COVID pandemic will have long lasting uncertain impacts on healthcare, including behavioral health. Next slide, please. To address many of these long-standing issues around access and quality, we must unify with other statewide partners, uh, both with healthcare delivery systems with, and with health plans, 
but also with other purchasers of healthcare and the Department of Managed Healthcare. This alignment as has been discussed today um, throughout the day is essential and will help amplify our message and our influence among the health plans and providers throughout California. And this alignment is something we've been consistently investing our time in already and have talked with you all about over the past several months as well. You'll be seeing more and more of this alignment in our contracting requirements and quality metric alignment. You can imagine the impact we could all have to improve quality if all three large public purchasers require our health plans to report and improve on the quality measures that really matter. Don and I have been meeting with Cover California and Medi-Cal on a bi-weekly basis to discuss alignment, especially as it relates to behavioral health. By unifying the focus, we're working to help all the health plans and all the provider systems focus in on the changes that matter. So next slide, please. This concludes our presentation. Thank you so much for your attention and your continued interest in behavioral health. Your interest and your engagement really does make a big difference in our collective efforts to improve behavioral health for our members. So we'd like to welcome questions and discussion. Thank you. Well, thank you, Dr. Logan and Dr. Riet uh, for a great presentation. And I'm checking to see if there are any questions from board members and not seeing any additional questions from board members. I will then check with Mr. Fox to see if there's anyone from the public who wish to make comments. President Jones, I, I think I saw a question from, uh, from Controller Yi. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, okay, Ms. Yee. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Ch Mr. President. Uh, thank you for the really um, great update on behavioral health and all of the uh, work in progress there. Um, I just had a couple questions. One is, uh, and I appreciated the statement about um, certainly um, e-mental health being uh, complementary rather than you know kind of standalone um, as a standalone option. And I was curious as to whether um, there are still out any outstanding um, HIPAA privacy concerns with respect to um, <clears throat> e-mental health, uh, because I think uh, just in terms of uh, traditional healthcare, that's always been you know just top of mind in terms of how uh, prominent that would ever become in terms of a, of a uh, strategy for providing healthcare. Yes, um, because of the pandemic, um, the the HIPAA requirements were I wouldn't say were um, eased, but they were um, oh, maybe I guess I would say eased. They were because of the of the rapid uh, switch to to telehealth that people didn't have everything up and running. But I think as we uh, as telehealth becomes much more integrated and we eventually move past the pandemic, that that will become first and foremost to make sure that those HIPAA re regulations are applied to telehealth modalities. Because that was, as you um, pointed out, that was one of the, the issues pre-pandemic and one was one of the barriers was the, the HIPAA concerns related to telehealth. Mm -hmm. All right, okay. And then um, it seems like every time, certainly when I turn on my phone or get online, there are uh, all kinds of um, self-marketing kinds of campaigns by um, mental behavioral health providers. And I guess my other question is, um, is that a concern with respect to unscrupulous, um, you know, I guess, uh, um, providers or, or just uh, knowing how vulnerable this population is and, and uh, and I hope that um, certainly our members are going to be hopefully contained within the, the network to where uh, or their health plan to get uh, care and uh, treatment. But uh, I'm concerned about kind of just how broadly this seems to be uh, now phenomena, and whether for the consumer there's any way of uh, knowing who's um, actually a bona fide um, provider and who's not. Um, yes, I would say that. That's always a concern. Um, we want our members to have high quality access to care to, to credentialed providers. And that is a big part of what our health plans do is that they credential providers. And so providers go through 
a very long process that some take, sometimes feels like it takes too long um, to make sure that um, providers in the network are um, certified, board certified and have all of the, the requirements they need to provide care. I think there will need to be um, a, an education going forward, just like with all of our smart technology where, um, and the warnings about phishing, uh, phishing, you know, that people trying to access data. Um, but we are, I think, you know, if we're gonna keep with this telehealth um, launch that we were launched into, which I think we will, um, that there will need to be more education um, for patients about how to be smart consumers and to protect their information and to access care through dedicated channels that do lead um, to approved providers or providers that have been checked out and what have you. Mm -hmm. um, I also just wanted to, to add on to the comment you said about the um, augmentation of care and not replacing care. I think this is one of the, the fields that has been uh, most impacted has been child psychiatry. So for our members that have dependents, um, uh, this has been a, a boon in many ways and a very difficult challenge in other. No child under the age of 10 does therapy well over Zoom, turns out. Um, and so this is really where child psychiatrists have been and child psychologists have been very firm that there will always have to be this allowance for um, inpatient care that we just absolutely can't, or not, not inpatient, but in-person care. However, in the same breath, they will say that the window into people's homes and the ability to easily have a case conference with the teacher, with the psychologist, maybe with the social worker or, you know, a divorced parents, but to be able to have that kind of remote conversation has really taken down walls and made it much easier to do um, group therapy and more the case management piece of child psychiatry or adolescent psychiatry. So again, I think with everything we're learning about what where it helps us and then also what it cannot replace. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, can I just ask on the HIPAA question, Julie, your response suggests that, um, and certainly the easing of the, uh, the HIPAA requirements uh, for this particular purpose, um, do you think that's something that will um, stay in place and be applicable more broadly just to telehealth generally? given just how constrained, I guess, the systems are. Yeah, I, I think pre-pandemic, there were so many barriers to telehealth. I mean, it was, as I mentioned, it, it, it's been proven, especially in behavioral health for decades. And there were so many barriers to it and, and payment was one of them, but then the HIPAA concerns were another big one. And so that, that's a, such a good point um, that we really do need to address the HIPAA concerns and the, the HIPAA logistics moving forward, kind of. And that's something to talk about with the three, lar the other two large purchasers as well, mm -hmm. how, how to get past that, because we don't want to move backwards. Right. Great. Thank you. Really appreciate the presentation. Thank you. Mr. Fechner? Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I just want to, first of all, thank Dr. Logan and Dr. Redhead for a great presentation. Actually, it seemed a little uplifting compared to the last time around, especially as far as the telehealth part is concerned. I do want to reach out and say that I hope that we're continuing to focus, uh, at least in part, on the LGBTQ and the transgender community, understanding with COVID and with uh, the substance abuse and all that. I totally, totally understand that, but that community, due to the fact that most providers are now canceling all elective procedures, they now have another layer of issues. Uh, so I hope that we're continuing to monitor that and making sure that these folks get the proper mental and behavioral health care that they need until such time as we can open back up with these elective procedures. So thank you for keeping that in, in the forefront. Excellent point, thank you. Okay, uh, Ms. Taylor. Yes, and I just want to uh, echo Mr. Fechner's um, support for this. The, uh, Dr. Logan, Dr. Redhead, I think this was a really good presentation considering, like I had said earlier, the last time we talked about this, there was a lot of talk about how access to care was, was very difficult 
and to find out that access to care is much easier even during the pandemic and thanks to telehealth kind of funny we say that because it, uh, they were able to adopt this telehealth even though that was something they didn't even want to do before it's kind of the same thing with teleworking but what what my point is that i hope we continue to work to make access more available for everyone and i also think it's important that we um take into account what's and i think you guys mentioned it what's happening now where people aren't seeking it and may seek it later so we may have an upswing after covid like they didn't maybe they didn't realize or whatever so i, I think this is an important step and, and i think we're in the right direction and i love the fact that you guys are always for the all the presentations talking about working with statewide partners to get um, accomplishments through. So I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Rubakawa. Thank you, uh, President Jones. Uh, uh, Ms. Uh, very good presentation. Uh, I particularly uh, appreciate how there was a, the whole focus on early intervention and uh, training the primary care physician, because at the last presentation, we talked about comorbidity, how when people present for a chronic disease or some other illness, depression may be part of the background or part of the cement that's creating all those problems. So I'm glad that that was a big focus there. And uh, so that's a good thing. And, and uh, but also I think because, uh, because uh, the stigma is is a little bit uh, easier to camouflage when it's, uh, you don't show up at the office, you're telework, tele, telehealth. Do you, ex and because uh, I guess the engagement with the physician tends to be a higher cost, do, do we expect any like uh, this to impact utilization, uh, uh, utilization impact will impact the premiums? Because I know generally we say during the COVID, People are not showing up to the hospitalization, so there's less cost, but this I think would be a different cost factor because it's a different uh, formula. So do we see, or we predict anything, and is it is that a bad thing, or is it gonna hit all the cares the same place, so it's gonna be just part of the cost trend, or is that is something Jewish, we can do? you want me to jump in on that one, or do you wanna take it? Thank you. I, yeah, I, Thank you. Oh, no, actually, I was going to pass it to you, Don, or to Marta, because you two are um, the most knowledgeable in that area, for sure. Sorry, sorry I'll just, I'll, I will, I'll start by saying that's an excellent question. <laughs> um, uh, you know, increased use of, um, of behavioral health services cuts in a couple of different ways. Um, one is that it's another service um, and we get, and, and there's a bill that's attached to that service. So you expect that uh, as more people use the service, costs go up. On the other hand, um, there's a lot of evidence um, as Julia mentioned that, um, uh, that comorbidities, um, uh, so when somebody has a behavioral health condition and a physical health condition, it is almost always the case that the physical health condition is made worse um, by the behavioral health condition. And that manifests its, it, itself in lots of different ways, um, ranging from uh, uh, lower um, uh, uptake of medications, um, uh, uh, patients who are not engaged in their own care to actual physical manifestations of, of, of the condition that are worse um, because of the behavioral health. So you would expect that as people get healthier because their behavioral health conditions are addressed that, um, that your costs would be going down. Now, how it pencils out is, um, uh, is a hard question to answer. There's not a ton of, um, of literature on it. There's certainly some that suggest that uh, for the right patients, you can save um, considerably uh, by investing in their behavioral health needs. Um, 
Uh, and you certainly, we certainly know that the uh, overall health of CalPERS members is going to go up um, as they're better able to address their behavioral health needs. So if we're thinking about what we're ultimately buying here, which is, which is improved health, um, it's a good investment. Um, whether or not in the short, medium, uh, or medium term it, it saves money is a, is a harder, harder one. And the only thing I would add is just overall the cost picture relative to COVID is still very, very murky. Um, so we do have, as we talked about during the rate setting process this year, we did have early in the pandemic, a lot of delayed and deferred care that allowed us to offset certain costs related to COVID-19. Um, through the middle part over the summer, we saw a lot of that care start to come back. Um, and so then we were not saving as much money. Then we locked back down again in the fall. So then we're starting to see more delayed and deferred. Now with the patient um, load related to COVID-19 going significantly up um, in the second wave that we're experiencing now. Those cases are very expensive. So where we're going to land in the long term about the costs related to COVID as a, as a pandemic, we don't yet know. Um, so I would just add that, that the, the picture is not yet clear. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Milton. Uh, thank you, Mr. President, and I want to echo uh, my colleagues in thanking uh, Dr. Uh, Logan and Dr. Redhead for this really good presentation. What I was struck by uh, as I listened to uh, both the presentation and the comments of my colleagues is the extent to which uh, we uh, on this board appreciate and understand uh, the importance of mental health. And CalPERS has uh, uh, taken uh, bold leadership in the past on many issues. Uh, and I would encourage uh, staff to bring to us uh, proposals and presentations that would allow uh, this board to uh, take some uh, very bold steps in terms of trying to make mental health uh, for our members something that is much more readily available uh, and something that for uh, individuals uh, with comorbidity, comorbidities uh, that, uh, that we are truly reaching out to individuals who would not define for themselves as having a mental health issue. Uh, but as we look at their progress or lack thereof in recovering from illnesses uh, that they should be able to recover from, uh, that uh, we examine uh, and help them examine the extent to which uh, there may be mental health issues that are uh, uh, blocking their ability to progress. Uh, this is, this is truly a time for bold action. Excellent comments. Okay. Um, see no additional questions from board members. Uh, Mr. Fox, are there anyone from the public who wish to make comments? No, Mr. President, there are no callers on this subject. Okay, thank you very much. And so for the board's uh, planning purposes, we will not have a closed session today. Uh, there's no new information to be provided. So why don't we take a 10 minute break in order to allow for the next group of speakers